As long as I was going after the crooks that didn't have badges, I was everybody's hero. Jason, it's so good to have you here today. We just had a great lunch over with Dan Moroso. How'd you like Moroso's? Oh, it was delicious. Thank you for the wonderful experience. I really loved the squash. Uh, uh, what, what was that I had? Squash ravioli. Yes, it Summer was so squash. good. Yes. Yeah. I get that nearly every time I go in. I love it. And But Jonathan always gives me a piece of his pizza. You always get one piece. I always get one piece. And uh, on this morning's podcast, it aired this morning uh, while you were driving up, we talked about you. We talked about that, Thursday night. That's Boy, why my ears were ringing. <laughs> it must have been. <laughs> we, we had such a wonderful time Thursday night. Voices for Justice. Uh, and tell us, about, uh, tell us about your organization, the one you work for. Uh, yes, uh, Proclaim Justice. We, we, that's uh, going to be our annual fundraiser now, uh, Voices for Justice. Um, we, we got the idea, or we got the, the name of it from the uh, fundraiser or event that was put together in front of the, uh, in Arkansas before I was released. Um, everybody just wanted to get the attention of the state Supreme Court and, and Arkansas judicial officials and say, hey, Everybody in the world is watching this case. Everybody knows these kids are innocent, so please stand up and do the right thing. And so we, we've tried to carry that tradition now and, and by starting this fundraiser here in Austin every year uh, to, yes, raise money because it costs a lot of money to defend innocent people you know, in prison. And, and I think, uh, uh, remember uh, during the auction the other night, you... you, you uh, when when the guitar was for sale, what what was it? What was it? I said to you, it was it was like it went for twenty grand, and you whispered in my ear, "That'll pay for one transcript." <laughs> <laughs> that is true. It's and, expensive. And you know this, don't you? Yes, I do. I do, and it's so expensive, it very is. expensive. But uh, we, Jonathan and I, talked a lot about your background and about the uh, the West Memphis Three, but we do know that. When you were only 16 years old, you were arrested for a crime you did not commit. You and two of your friends, uh, none of you were involved in this crime. It went crazy. It was just, uh, it just went crazy with the rumors and with uh, the politics and everything involved, looking for a scapegoat. And unfortunately, you three teenagers were those scapegoats. Yeah. And it just breaks my heart. to, th and, and I've watched the movies, and I've seen you sitting there, that sweet little innocent-looking kid, you know? And I'm thinking, there's no way. There's no way. And they're accusing you guys of satanic rituals, satanic oh, yeah. murders, that now with all the the uh, forensics that's done after the fact, we know that, that were, those were satanic turtles, <laughs> that, that put those marks on those poor boys and, yeah. and not not a knife, not right. you guys. And it just shows how people's craziness can just go unwound and create all kinds of additional collateral victims. Correct. And you three were collateral victims of that. And it took over 18 years to get you guys out of prison. Yeah. And the work of a lot of good people volunteering their time, volunteering their money, believing in you, and also you believing in them and believing in the process yes. and not giving up. And I got to tell you, Jason, I have studied your story. I have been so happy to get to know you. My heart goes out to you and to the other two guys and to everybody out there that you're trying to help right now and i just want to say i respect you i love you and i thank you thank you big that means the world to me and i love you too brother and i really appreciate what you're doing here in, in this arena here in texas you know fighting the good fight because it's an uphill battle you know all the way um most people don't understand that innocent people are accused of crimes and, and sent to prison all the time and and there's this mentality to where we somehow want to believe that that the police that we entrust you know to protect us are doing the right thing and doing their job but it's not always the case you know no it's not and they're just human that's and, true and humans make mistakes yes and we should not have a system in place that is going to 
rubber stamp those mistakes and say, well, it doesn't matter that there's somebody innocent in prison. It just knocks me over backwards that actual innocence doesn't mean anything in this country, that you have to find some technicality to get a case reversed on rather than actual innocence. Right. And you guys were actually innocent. Mm-hmm. And, and it's really weird because people tend to complain about the courts releasing people on technicalities, but then the courts are set up to where the only way they'll release a person is on a technicality because they don't want to look at innocence issues anymore, where finality becomes the issue instead of solving the crime. And and to me, that just has turned justice upside down. Justice is upside down. And I've got to say that I think we're just now realizing that justice is upside down. I think it's been upside down all along. You know, this is not a new thing. We've been convicting innocent people since this country began. We've been convicting innocent people since the beginning of time. And what I see is an evolution of consciousness that's now making us, as a people, as a globe, as a country, want to do something about it and correct it and to do what's right rather than do what's final, rather than just do what's easy. Definitely. People don't want to think that they're going to lose their children, lose their fathers or mothers or sisters and brothers to a system that's, you know, not trying to find the right perpetrator. That's just trying to convict a person because they can. Because the system is all powerful. It can convict just about anybody, you know, because it can. It can set the deck in such a way to where it's stacked against a person and the people watching from the outside from home you know watching the news don't know the difference they're not none the wiser and it's because they're only getting one side of the story and that's a side that's not factual or accurate that's true they're only getting one side of the story and people are so quick to believe that's one thing i'm asking people to do is don't be so quick to believe what the police and the prosecutors say We have a constitution in this country, and our constitution says that a a criminal defendant is innocent until proven guilty. Well, too often that burden is reversed, and when people go in for jury duty, they see the defendant sitting in the chair and they go, well, I wonder what he did. You know, what's he here for? He's guilty. He's guilty unless they prove to me he's innocent. And that's total flip-flop, Jason. It's not supposed to be that way. And I really hope we can get our, our jurors educated so that they will hold the government to the burden of proof. You know, we're quick to talk about the Constitution and praise the Constitution, just to like the way some people praise the Bible, but they've never read it, you know? Mm-hmm. We need to read those holy scriptures, we need to read that Constitution, and we need to endeavor to live by it so that we don't have things happening to innocent people like what happened to you. That's true. The the presumption of innocence must be protected from the very beginning in order to ensure that a trial is fair because the presumption of innocence is what makes it fair. If you remove that ingredient from it, it can't be fair. Um, during my own trial, the uh, during board hour, what I would learn later on, the who would be, elected as jury foreman, he, he well, as soon as he went into board hour before we ever questioned him, he had it in his mind that we were guilty and that he was going to convince the jury to find us guilty. Um, I remember my attorney, Paul Ford, asking me, like, as we were beginning board hour, he's like, hey, Jason, I want you to look into the eyes of each of these potential jurors and let me know what type of feel for you that you get for each of these people. You know, if there's malice that you're feeling or any type of ill will or anything. And I said, Paul, I can't see that far. I, can, I can't see barely past my nose. I don't, I just can't see. You mean because of your vision? My vision, yeah. my vision. I'm blind. And, yeah. and I've never had a pair of glasses, couldn't afford them. And so, and, and, and as a kid, you know, I'm just a kid that's sitting there. And, and, and Paul told me, he says, Jason, I will get you a pair of glasses as soon as this trial is over with, and I get you home. And to me, that was reassuring because I'm a kid and I don't know any better. But now looking back as an adult, with, with, you know, and, and, and looking back over that situation, what Paul should have done was said, Your Honor, 
Let's hold this voir dire in abeyance. Let's put it on pause. I just asked my client to assist in his own defense for the very first time, and he was unable to due to physical inability. He needs a pair of glasses. Exactly. Let's get his eyes tested. Exactly. Now, yeah. had he have done that, I may have been able to see the lie behind that jury foreman's eyes during voir dire, and I may have been able to raise my hand and say, Paul, that guy right there is no good. Mm-hmm. Also, you needed the glasses so that you could see the witnesses from the witness stand and read their reactions and read their faces and be able to tell your lawyer what you thought about that. I cannot go to trial unless my client can assist me in his defense. If my client cannot assist me in his or her own defense, then that's the same as being mentally incompetent Correct. to, to, to stand trial, whether it's because of your your mental faculties are because of some physical disability like a like no eyesight, a lack of eyesight, and being able to help your lawyer there. Correct, correct, definitely. I look at every juror that I question, and I ask myself while I'm talking to this juror, is this somebody that I'd feel okay sitting down and having a cup of coffee with and just shooting the crap with? Is this somebody I could have a glass of wine with and feel okay and not feel leaked out? And if I feel a little bit of a flag in my stomach, I don't want that drawer. Sometimes I cannot articulate why, but it's because I can see them. And you can read faces. You can read those things, and it sends these subliminal signals to your brain and to your gut to help you yeah. make those decisions. So. And, and, and you know what, Vic? The, the, re, the flip side of that is also true. Because when a juror is sitting up there, they're trying to make some type of eye connection with you if you're sitting in the defense table, right? And they're wanting to reach across with their eyes and connect. And so when there's certain testimony, they're trying to try to make a connection. But if you're like me at the time, blind, and can't focus on anything or anyone. What if they don't know that? They don't know I'm blind. So what if they misconstrue me trying to find an eye to connect to, but I'm so blind I can't? What if they misconstrue, misconstrue that as evidence of guilt, saying, look, he can't look me in the eye. He must oh be guilty. Oh, my God. You're absolutely right about that. I've never thought about it from that direction. That is so true, Jason. That Yeah, that puts you at a disadvantage from the get-go. All the way. All the way. Not to mention the fact that the prosecution and the police had already decided to pin this case on somebody. Oh, yeah. No matter who did it, they wanted to pin it on somebody. And when the idea came up that it was a satanic ritual murder, oh, my God, that just made them just like uh, shiver in their pants. I remember those days when everybody was talking about satanic worship and satanic ritual and, and all the all the uh, false convictions that came about because of that basically urban rumor that never even really existed. Right. Yeah. So, God, my heart goes out to you. It was just a perfect storm of bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. It's the worst thing to be accused of. It's like they saw anything and everything to push anyone and everyone's hate buttons against us to where people would just hate us so much that it didn't matter what the evidence was, they were programmed to convict. And there's still people that feel that way. Even after all the evidence that's come out, even after all the exonerating evidence, even after your foundation and Voices for Justice and everything the Dixie Chicks have done and Eddie Veter and all those guys, and there's still these nuts out there that still are basically stalking you, it appears. I, I do get death threats um, from people um, on the regular. I had someone post my address at one time and invited people to come out and shoot me. And, and, and yeah, it's scary. I don't know who. It could be anybody. I'm so sorry. Because they're, they're identityless, you know. They don't share their identity. It's always behind some fake uh, uh, Twitter or Facebook account or whatever. So I copy it. I, I create a screenshot of it. I file it, and then I have a file of these I've been collecting for years now and should ever anything ever happen to me they will be investigated but I, I try to live my life the best that I can no matter what people are saying no matter what people are doing I can only hold myself accountable to my ideals and standards and my moral judgment and so I do my best I try not to live in fear 
I try not to let those threats keep me, you know, locked in my home and scared to come out. You know? I admire you for that. And I admire the work you're doing today. Before we get into that, though, I want to tell you, Jonathan and I keep a file. It's it's about two feet thick now, and we call it our nut file. The nut file. Oh, no. <laughs> the nut yep. file. The nut file. <laughs> tell about the nut file. It's full of nuts. Anything from uh, people who uh, wear tinfoil hats think the aliens are after them to... You know, anybody and everybody from, from your past, from the DA indictment days, oh, yeah, we, we get them all. Everybody sends us a crazy letter. Right. It goes in the nut file. Or a crazy email, we print oh, yeah. it, put it in the nut file. And okay. if everything happens, we know to start with a nut file. I and as an aside that. to that, it's actually pretty amazing how many people think UFOs are after them. Totally an aside, but there, there's a lot of UFO nut ones in there. Yeah. Those might be drones. Might be drones. Just throw this, <laughs> these supernatural element into this. <laughs> This could be drones. <laughs> I, I've got a guy that works for me who he can't tell me who he used to work for or he'd have to kill me. Oh, no. Uh, that's what he says. That's what he says. And he tells us that those drones have been around, those little tiny drones that look like flies. Right. Oh, they've yeah. been around for 20 years. They've been using them in Iraq and Iran and places like that for over 20 years. Oh, wow. And, but they're just now getting out into the public uh, now. Right. But he said, oh, we had those 20 years ago. Oh, Great. wow. That's, yeah. that's wild. I love this guy. Yeah. <clears throat> you met I love him. technology. You met him earlier here in my office, but uh, he can read upside down. <laughs> when, when somebody comes and sits and they put their legal pad across the desk from us or across the conference table and they're the other lawyer or the mediator, as soon as they leave the room, he can tell me everything that's written on there. He can just glance at it. And oh, wow. It takes a mental picture, and he can just can read it upside down. He's That's an, an amazing, amazing talent. Yeah, I, <laughs> I wish I had that. I love yeah. having him on staff. He's really good. It makes people think I'm a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> I shouldn't be giving away our secrets. <laughs> yeah, what do you well, doing? you know, it's like Apple. You know, Tim Cook and Steve Jobs, you know, they put together the brightest minds to, you know, to put together the best product and, yeah. and, and projects. So, you know, you got... You're only as smart as your team, right? Yeah. Or, or you're only as strong as the weakest link in the chain. That's so. true. So, Jonathan, all you guys, you're 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 only as strong as I am because I'm, I'm the weakest link. Oh, in the chain. oh no! Is that outrun the bear situation? <laughs> yes, that's true. That's sad. Well, Jason, tell us about your organization now and what you're doing now. Yeah, we are. We call ourselves Proclaim Justice. We're an actual innocence organization. Um, we tend to focus on the cases that don't have DNA that just require, you know, uh, good old fashioned investigative work, um, things like that. Those are harder. They are very hard. Um, however, you know, those people deserve a hope as well. You know, and, and I couldn't tell you the number of letters I wrote for people when I was a law library clerk. You know, to various organizations trying to get help and. A lot of the organizations, you know, they're, they're only have the funding and, and the manpower to help you if you have some type of DNA at work in, right. in your case. And, you know, and that's that's not every case. No, it's not. And so we try to pick up the slack on that. Um, one of our board members, Jason Flom, he's 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 our board member. He's also one of the founding members and board member of the actual Innocence uh, Project at, out of the Cordoza School of Law in New York. And they predominantly focus on DNA cases. They will take other cases here and there, but mostly DNA cases. And so he likes to say he's got the, or, or think he's got the one-two punch, you know, so he's got DNA in one hand, then he's got investigation in the other. And so our, our, our cases take a lot longer, it seems like, to come to fruition. Yeah. You know, you have to be in it for the long haul. When you decide to take a case, you have to be able to Say, you know what, when I start work on this case, I'm going to see it all the way to its finish you know, mm -hmm. and beyond. You know, like uh, at the event the other night that y'all you know, got to attend with me, you know, for Proclaim Justice, you know, Voices uh, uh, for Justice, um, Daniel, uh, Daniel Viegas, when he was up on the stage, he, he was talking about, you know, not only do we fight to get you free, but we work with you once you've been free to put together your life, however that looks, you know. And so... We, when we take a case, we have to look at it all the way, you know, your whole life, you know, getting you free and helping you put your life together. And that's a huge commitment. That is a huge commitment. It really is. And that's a, that's a full circle commitment. That's more than just getting somebody out. It's making sure they stay out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
got to, you know, it's like the Beatles sing, you know, I get by with a little help from my friends. Amen. It takes a village. It does. And so we have to learn to be a village again. Yes, we do. We have to help each other, you know. Capitalism, I'm all for capitalism and earning your way, but there there comes a point when it becomes extreme, you know, where we're flipping houses and we're forgetting that houses are for people to live in. Yes. Not to be flipped or sold at extraordinary prices where no one can afford to live any longer. Amen. we have to slow down on some things, yeah. I, I believe, and, and get back to basics, which is taking care of each other. Take care of each other. I agree. Mm-hmm. Now, you're talking about how your organization has two, two approaches now, the, the DNA and the investigative. Now, I love the DNA because it's cheaper. And when you got it, man, you got it. Oh, yes, you got it. The investigative, that's the hard work. That, that's where the dance is. Yeah, that's the nose to the grindstone. Yes. The DNA, you collect it, you send it off, you wait and see what happens. Right. The investigative, whoa, that's hard work. That's the elbow grease. That's the nose to the grindstone. That's the midnight oil. Mm-hmm. That's studying every word backwards and forwards and seeing where those inconsistencies are and where the lies come out. Yes, sir. That is difficult. And y'all have people in your organization that's doing that? Oh, yes. I have, I have some great investigators who work for us. Um, number one, my co-founder, uh, John Wesley Harden, who, who's named after uh, the old outlaw turn uh, lawyer. I was going to say, singer. I know that name. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, he, he is a great person. He is an investigator. And, and, and you know, it, it takes that, you know, going out finding the witnesses, finding someone to talk to who hasn't been talked to before, who needs to be spoken to, who has that that piece of information that can make or break your case, you know, that can totally solve it. You know, so it is a lot of hard work. It's a lot of sleepless nights. And it's a lot of, you know, just trying to figure out what the picture is. And you guys case. aren't getting rich on this either. This is this is a labor of love. It is a labor of love. We're definitely not getting rich. It right. all goes back into the work. Expenses you know, and work. Expenses, and, definitely. Yes. We, we talked earlier about the price of a, a single transcript, you know, and that's if the department says the transcript still exists. Uh, we just succeeded in getting a transcript for one of our cases that for two years we were told that the transcripts were lost. So, oh, my goodness. So just acquiring that transcript beyond the monetary value, which was ten grand thereabouts, you know, beyond that, it's priceless because you need that to know what yes, happened you do. You know, during the trial. And so you can attack the case and find out where the flaws were. Mm-hmm. You know, what? how was the jury misled? What was the piece of evidence that sunk it in their minds? You know, that way you can go and look at it and say, was this real evidence or was this fabricated evidence? Yeah. Or was it just misrepresented? Yeah. You know, too often it's misrepresented. I see so much police misconduct and prosecutorial misconduct that breaks my heart. These are people who are charged with a duty to protect and defend a duty to see that justice is done. And so often it just goes awry. And without people like your organization getting into those transcripts, studying, reading between the lines, those things never come to light. That is true. That is true. Um, I think for a long time we put too much pressure on the police to solve crimes quickly. And as a result, they've adapted to that pressure. Mm -hmm. And instead of taking the time to solve a case and study a case and work a case no matter how long it takes without the pressure to immediately solve it and and to follow the case where it goes you know it it, it lends to to reaching a false conclusion it does you know and we put too much pressure on our prosecutors to convict not only do the citizens put pressure on the prosecutors to convict but the police do they do. Too often the police think that the prosecutor is their lawyer. You represent me in this criminal case. Well, they don't. They represent the citizens. Correct. They're supposed to be the buffer mm-hmm. between the citizens and the police, not the lawyer for the police. The police have enough power. Mm-hmm. We should be in a position to celebrate and, 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 and say to prosecutors, that they've done a great job, that they are doing a wonderful job when they have investigated and they have come to the conclusion, you know what, this person right here is not the person that fits this crime. This is not the guilty person. We may be able to 
fabricate a believable story and we may be able to win a conviction but the reality is that this person is innocent and so we need to celebrate those prosecutors who are strong enough to say hey let this person go let's keep the case open let's pursue the evidence no matter where it goes we that need is to so celebrate well said. them when they can change directions so well said i totally agree with that and that is a good approach because we need to reward our prosecutors for doing the right thing. Doing the right thing. Yeah, not for getting the conviction, unless that is the right thing, but doing the right thing. Make sure we've got the right defendant. Make sure we're laying out the evidence in a truthful way. Yeah. Correct. And, and, and too much, you know, too long. Uh, the criminal system and, and investigative procedures is built on a house of lies. Mm -hmm. It's okay for a police it's okay for a prosecutor to lie to you during the course of an investigation. And when these lies, they, they're, 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 they lie about the evidence and they're, they're put together to make you feel hopeless, to make you feel like the truth cannot set you free. And so this lends itself to wrongful convictions and it lends itself to the actual perpetrators remaining free and going unpunished for their crimes. Exactly. Just like on the Henry Lee Lucas confessions. You've been listening to my podcast. I have. All these murderers out there who really killed these people walking around free because the Texas Rangers let Henry Lucas give a false confession and they wanted to believe it. They even fed him the information. Mm -hmm. And now, thank God, 30 years later, a lot of these cases are being solved with DNA. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Hopefully I mean, some might get solved with some good investigative technique, but getting the law enforcement officers willing to look at something that old is almost impossible. Right. And, and, it, and it, really, it really blows my mind that they would rest a conviction on a believable story. You know, I mean, I can, I, I've, I've studied enough NASA that I could probably make a believable story to convince you that I could fly, you know, a space shuttle. But you don't want to get in a space shuttle with me. I can't fly that thing. Yeah. Right? I'm going to wreck us all. So why do we give so much credence to a false confession? Exactly. When we can demonstrate that it's false. And if you notice on the false confessions, especially when there are multiple defendants, they always go after the one with the lowest IQ first. They did that with you guys. Yes. They did that with uh, uh, when they see us. Yes, uh, that one. Um, always going after the lowest uh, IQ, feeding them the information, then honing it. Hours and hours of uh, tape recorded interrogation disappearing. Oh yes. And then you end up with a three-page type document that looks like airtight. Well, that's the read technique. It's the way they're trained, and the officers are just going by their training. Mm -hmm. And the training itself is what's wrong. Exactly. And I do concur. It's much better than the third degree. We don't want to beat people into submission. That's barbaric and wrong and against all of our moral values. But at the same time, we can't lie to people until they're just completely hopeless and to where they'll just admit to anything to make the, the punishment stop. I know. Take some 16-year-old kid and interview him for 20 hours. You know, 18 hours, that's just After not right. After the first hour is evident that they don't know anything about the crime. Like our case, Daniel Viegas in El Paso, before he was ever arrested, you know, there were four kids walking down the street, you know, coming home from a party. And somebody, you know, does a drive-by and shoots at them and shoots two of them. And the two who survived ran off, you know. By the time they came back to the scene where their friends were murdered, the police split them apart and try to make them confess to the crime and told each of them that the other had already admitted to it and said that the other was the one involved, that they might as well go ahead and come clean and save themselves. And this is the tactic they use. Standard kids all over America. Standard everybody. operating procedure. Scare the hell out of them, get them to say a lie, and then hold them to it. Yes, and that's no way to reach justice. That's no way to get to the truth. No, and it's that's not. that's no way to conduct this business of, you know, peacekeeping a while ago when you mentioned uh, john wesley harden you said uh, outlaw turned lawyer i'm yep. really glad to hear it in that order because too often it's the other way around <laughs> 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 lawyer turned outlaw really and some of these some of these prosecutors they started out with a law degree but because of the way they're behaving now 
they're outlaws. They are outside the justice system doing evil to people oh, and doing yes. wrong to people. Their lawyers become outlaws oh, yes. instead of vice versa. I, I remember my first encounter with John Fogelman, prosecutor who would sentence me to life without. First time I met him, I was just 11 years old. Oh, my God. I was 11. My little brother was 9. Tell us about that. Uh, we just moved to Arkansas from Memphis. Um, my mom was running from my alcoholic stepfather. My grandmother uh, moved. Like I came home from school, my last day of school, thinking we were going to have a, a full summer in Memphis, but there's a moving truck you know, out in front of my house and my grandparents. You know, It was a secret because my mom already knows my brothers and I can't hold water. We would tell my stepdad if we knew we were going to move. Right. You know? And so all of a sudden, we're just moving. And we were sad because we were leaving all of our friends behind, you know. And it's not like today where you keep in touch with the cell phone, you know. You say goodbye to your friends. That's it. That's you know, it. Bye-bye. And so we moved to uh, uh, Marion, Arkansas, Lakeshore Trailer Park, where my grandmother had several trailers that she rented out. And so she gave my brothers and I, my mom, a trailer to live in right there on the lake. And so we made friends fast with the kids out there, you know, and uh swam in the lake and play hide and go seek in the uh, soybean and cotton fields and stuff well one day we're out there there's this old tin shed out in the very middle of the soybean field right and i don't know how long it'd been there i don't know how long it'd been there were no like no trespassing signs or anything like that and all the kids from the trailer park had been playing there for years and they're like, oh, we'll go over here and play hide and go seek. And there, I remember there was a tree on the outside of the building. And I don't know how long it takes a tree to grow. Long time, a lot longer than how I was old then at right. the time. But this tree had to start outside the building. But over time, it had grown and it had pushed its way into the building and it had lifted the roof off the place, you know, just lifted the roof off. That's how long it had been wow. growing, right? And so to the kids, we would climb up the tree on one side and then climb down the tree inside. And there would be uh, sunflowers looking up at us, greeting us, you know, because they, cause the roof was up right there. And they could see and there were these old shells of cars. And to us, they became X-Wing TIE Fighters, Millennium Falcons. I mean, we used our imagination. We were kids. You know, we were told to go outside and play, and that's what we did. And we had a, a blast all summer. Well, then one day, something happened that never happened before. The front doors opened up while we were inside of this place. And there were two old men there and several vans of police. And they rounded us all up. I think they uh, rounded up about 12 of us that day. All kids, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12, maybe 13. And took us to the police station and was like, how long have you been playing out here? You know? What was that for? Uh, <laughs> you know, they, they they didn't charge us with anything right then, but first they were questioning us, you know, how did you learn about this place? You know, did you have any other friends? Do you have any other brothers, any sisters, any cousins that played here? And so by the end of the day, instead of it just being the 12 kids that were arrested, every kid in the trailer park was brought in because everybody had played there at one point or another, right? That's what kids had been doing there for generations, you know, ever since who knows when. And so called our parents, come pick us up from the jail. I get a court-appointed attorney, Mr. Montgomery. What were you charged with? Trespassing? Uh, criminal trespassing, oh breaking God. and entering. Um, and so... Mr. Montgomery tells my mom and, and my me and my younger brother, Matt, you know, I, I was 11, Matthew was nine, tell us like, y'all are just kids playing hide and go seek. They'll throw this out. Don't even worry about it. Here's a New Testament Bible. Here's you a New Testament Bible. Gave my brother and I each a New Testament Bible. Said, don't worry about it. And so we didn't, you know, my mom didn't, you know. And so we end up in court, all of us kids, you know, all of our parents, you know, in Marion Courthouse and the prosecutor was John Fogelman, and he stood up in front of the court and said, Your Honor, I think two years in the state reform school would do all these kids some good. What? Oh, yes. That's what he said. Just and for what, playing in an abandoned building. We were playing hide-and-go-seek. And my public defender, who was the public defender of everyone, stood up and said, Your Honor, I agree. What? Oh, yes. And at that point, my mom jumped up and said, Your Honor, my sons aren't going to kids' prison. And that's when the judge says, ma'am, counsel, come up to my bench. 
And so they went up there and talked for a few minutes. And then when my mom came back, she used her, you will not argue with me voice. You know, you know, parents have that. Oh, yeah, and, and right. They, my mom had that look. Yeah. Oh, yes. And she, she put the, the look on me and, and all that and said, you will sign this. And it was five years probation, $500 fine for each of us. And um, if, if anything was destroyed in that place, it was destroyed by time, the elements, and neglect, not by us kids. If anything know? was destroyed in that place, it was respect for law enforcement for that doing that truth. to kids. That is truth. I mean, I did that kind of stuff all the time when I was a kid, but you know, I'm, I'm older than you, and back in those days, you know, it, it wasn't like it was now or even when you were a kid. I mean, yeah. uh, and, and so, and so we'd we have all, the owner come out and shoot a shotgun up in the air at us and we'd all run and scream and that'd be about it. You know, <laughs> I wish that was the case. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been less damaging for yeah. sure. Yeah. Less long lasting. What you're describing, I, we had a place like that down, down the hill and close to the river from where, where I lived. And me and my friends would go down there, climb the fence and, ride the guys Shetland ponies, you know, until they'd buck us off and kick us in the head. And, and uh, he'd come out and shoot a shotgun at us and run us off. And oh, wow. We'd all get a big laugh and that was it. But that was a different world. Different world. It's just too yeah. punitive now. It is. Uh, the philosopher Nietzsche, uh, there's a lot he said I don't agree with, but one thing he said that I do agree with, and that's fear those in whom the instinct to punish is great. Mm. And there are a lot of people out there who just have a judgmental instinct and an instinct to want to punish people for no reason. Oh, yes. Those are the ones we need to be afraid of. We need to be more afraid of those people than we do of people out there making little infractions of the law. A lot of right. times that's just mischief. A lot right. of times that's just kids having a good time, you know? Definitely. But these people that are wanting to punish people and, and ruin people's lives for no reason, that's just evil. Well, in my experience, um, you know, those slavery, hereditary with slavery was abolished, you know, with the 13th Amendment, mm -hmm. the Civil War. Um, it was replaced by um, slavery for felons, those mm -hmm. convicted of felony. And so what we have now is um, instead of people being born into slavery, you have a system that tries to put you into slavery at the earliest possible point it can in your life. And for us, they tried to put me into slavery at the age of 11, tried That's to put my true. little brother into slavery at the age of nine. Had my mom not stood up and said, her sons aren't going, her sons aren't going to kids prison. That prosecutor and that public defender and that judge would have allowed it to happen. Yeah. And, and, and we're, we're given this false assurance that because we have a, a defender, a public defender, that we're being defended. And a lot of times we aren't. Those guys are overworked. They're underpaid. A lot of them are burned out, burned out to the point of alcoholism and drug abuse, some of them. And things are just being put in a sausage grinder and people's lives totally forgotten about. We got to remember that we're dealing with human beings and human lives and futures. And, and, and everything has a ripple effect. You know? Oh yes, that that is true. Um, I'm sure it had a ripple effect on your family. Oh yeah. Um, when when I was arrested, it destroyed my family. Um, the media painted such a terrible picture of me that everyone felt it was their responsibility to torment my mom and my brothers um, by setting fire to things and throwing it in the windows, by burning a literal cross in our yard. You had a cross burned in your front I yard. I had a cross burned in my front yard while I was in jail. Like oh my they, God! Like my little brothers, Matthew, at age, well, he was fourteen at that point, and Terry was eleven then. You know, yes, and my mom had to take care of them in this hostile environment. You know, and try to, and and her, like I, I told you, you know, like we ran from my stepfather. You know, and she had a job across the street, across the uh, Mississippi River. You know, at a trucking agency as a nighttime dispatcher, but her employer told her said i understand you're going to want to go to all your son's court hearings and stuff like that i can't stop you but you're not going to have a job to return to wow and so instead of the community like coming together to help her they just turned their back on her and made life 
living hell for her. And at that point, that winter was one of the coldest in Arkansas's history. Like the trees were freezing and exploding. It was so cold. And my mom couldn't even put heat in, you know, keep the house heated. That's so sad. Yeah. I'm so sorry about that. I really am. And a lot of these judgmental people that do such evil things, they think they're doing it. They think they're doing it in the name of some kind of higher order, some kind of religion. I wish people would actually read the words of Jesus and they could not do the kind of things they do. They would have to be more tenderhearted. They would have to be more loving, less judgmental, and more open. You know? Now, not everybody is a Christian. I, I have friends that are atheists. I have friends that are Buddhist. I have friends that are, that are Muslim. But I believe that we go back to the original teachers. Uh, all the Holy Scriptures are given for our edification and for our learning and our correction. Right. And people need to get into that and quit acting out like a bunch of toddlers. So many of the people, the person that burned the cross in your mom's front yard, mentality of a toddler. Right. Some of the prosecutors, mental, mentality of a toddler. I don't get my way, I'm going to throw a temper tantrum. I'm going to lie and I'm not going to feel guilty about it. Right. And that's just wrong. I, I, I support anybody's pursuit of religion and, and, and making a connection with their creator as long as they're empowered to compassion. Empowered to compassion. Yeah, I'm not much into religion. I've given up most of the... Uh, the pomp, the circumstance, the ceremony. <laughs> right. uh, but I'm really into spirituality. Right. And I'm really into the words, the loving words of Jesus. When I go to the Bible, I usually read the stuff that's in red. Just the stuff that's in red. That's Jesus' words. And when you read what he said, man, it doesn't fit with a lot of this modern-day Christianity. No. It doesn't fit. Because this Christianity today is too judgmental. It's too mean-spirited. It's too black-hearted. It's too much against everything that Jesus talked about. Oh, yes. And if we would open our hearts to justice and to love, we would see fewer of these convictions, wrongful convictions. We'd see prosecutors happy to see justice done rather oh, than yes. just rack up another conviction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, wow, my heart goes out to you and your mom and your brothers, because I know that all of you had a hard time over this. Oh, yeah. Now, you were friends with, uh, with uh, Damien and, and the other young boy, but y'all were just little bike riding teenagers. I first met uh, Jesse uh, that first one after I was arrested at age 11. You know, I got a record. And, but then I would start school that school year in the sixth grade, and it's my first day of school. In, in, in Marion, Marion Patriots, and um, went very well. You know, I made friends with all the kids in class and everything, and so then we had recess, right? So that's the, not just your class, but all the classes go outside and play, and uh, I'm standing out there, you know, meeting new people and stuff, and people ask me where I'm from. I'm telling them, I'm from Tennessee, over there across the river, you know, and all that, and they're like, oh, that's cool. And next thing I know, out the corner of my eye, I see somebody, like, moving toward us really fast like just running and then all of a sudden a fist materializes out of this blurry shape for my face and so I duck and I take off running and this kid is right on my tail in pursuit right and then I hear this girl yell Jesse stop Jesse stop come here and I look over my shoulder and he stopped chasing me and goes over to her towards this little blonde headed girl and I stop as well and kind of go towards them and I hear her tell him, Jesse, promise me you won't try to hit him again. I said, promise me, Jesse, you will not try to hit him again. And he, he promised her he wouldn't try to hit me again. And that little girl, was, her name was Donna Spurlock and she would become a good friends with me, you know, for the rest of the school year until she would move away. But uh, that was my first encounter with Jesse. Wow. You know, he was a school bully. School bully. And he was going to punch the new kid. Yeah. From Tennessee. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember one like that at my school, fifth grade. Yeah, yeah, and so that's that's pretty much my relationship with Jesse. And then years later, um, 
like I mentioned, uh, and when I first moved to the trailer park, there were kids everywhere, and we all made friends fast. But after we were arrested, it kind of changed the trailer park. The parents, you know, were under strict rules to not allow the kids to play with one another because we all now had a record. We weren't allowed to play with one another, and so no one was allowed to be friends really anymore. So no one was allowed to really go outside much, to hang out much, and so it changed the entire neighborhood. Well, several years later, when I was biking from home, you know, coming from the store or whatever, and I, you know, going down the road next to the road next to my house, and I see a kid out in the street skating on a skateboard, a kid I'd never seen before. So I hit the brakes on my bike. I was like, hey, who are you? He's like, my name is Michael. I was like, dude, cool skateboard. He's like, cool bike. I was like, let me check it out. And, and, you know, we let each other check out each other's rides and, and we became fast friends. You know, it was the only kid I was legally allowed to play with in the trailer park. Because he hadn't been caught he up in the other stuff. He did not have a record. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And that's how we became friends. We became friends from then on. And he was like, oh, yeah, I saw you in study hall the other day, you know, because we had study hall together. But I couldn't see that far, so I didn't recognize him. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. God, my heart goes out to you. It really does. I remember when I found out that uh, my little boy couldn't see. Uh, we were sitting at a stoplight, and I, he was in like third or fourth grade, and I said, look at that bumper sticker. He goes, what bumper sticker? Oh, yeah. I go, you can't see that bumper sticker? And he goes, no. So, man, I had him at the doctor the next day, and they were fitting him for glasses. And I remember when he first got him, it was like, Wow. I can actually see where we're going. I thought we had just been driving into a fog. <laughs> oh, yes. So, yeah. That's real. So I can, I can appreciate that. I got mine in prison. Um, wow. My first pair. And uh, it was like seeing a new world. But there I was in a world that really didn't, I shouldn't, I didn't want to see. Yeah, seeing a new world, but a world you didn't want to see. Yeah. Wow. It's so sad that the government was able to get their claws into you and into all the other kids in that neighborhood at such an early age. And that's something we're seeing a lot. Is it's how, systemic. It's systemic. It really is how they just want to get people into the system. Mm-hmm. And once you're into the system, you don't get out of it. No, your name is in the hat. From that moment on, I've been in class at school and on the intercom, send Jason to the uh, principal's office. I have to go to the principal's office. There's my parole officer, my probation officer. Oh my. I have to give an account of my my school records, mm-hmm. being in class. I can't miss any class. I have to explain if I miss a day of class or anything. There and they come and reason. pull you out in front of your yeah. friends and embarrass you in front of your friends and, in, and stigmatize you in front of everyone and, and, else. And that's the thing, because people outside looking in don't know that we were playing hide-and-go-seek. Right. They're just like, oh, all those kids from that trailer park have oh, a record. Yeah, they're they bad. all get called out to the principal's office to see their probation officer. They're all trouble. Mm-hmm. you don't want to talk to them mm. i'm so sorry i really am because that's the way it starts so many times you know and once you're into the system the deck seems to be stacked against you to it is ever get you. out mm-hmm. they they make it so that you're they set it up from the beginning so that you're going to fail oh yes by putting too many requirements on you having you do things that there's no way you can humanly possibly do, you know, like sometimes be in two places at once. Well, you got to be in school, but you got to be over here with the probation officer. Oh, you got to be working, but you got to be going to this class, you know, Mm -hmm. and it just, it's not a workable situation. Oh, and you got to, you got to be paying your fines. You got to be paying your child support. You got to be paying your rent, but you got to be paying all this stuff to the court too. We, we we had a uh, budget, before that of a hundred bucks for Christmas for the whole family. My mom owed five hundred dollars for me. She owed five hundred dollars for Matthew. That's ten Christmases. Yeah. I was eleven. Wow. Uh, those were Christmases gone all the way until yeah. my adult years. Yeah. You know, <laughs> they would get me, you know. But because of that, it wasn't out of the ordinary from then on for a police officer to arrive in my driveway, call me up out of my house to go sit in the car so I can be questioned about crimes that I don't know anything about. Right. I had been questioned about so many crimes from the age of 11 to 16 
that it seemed normal to me. It seemed normal to me. So when, after the murders happened and those little boys, when they were murdered, when the police show up at my house asking about those crimes, it seemed normal to me that they were asking me about them. I still didn't have any answers. I didn't know anything about it. But the fact that they were asking me about it didn't seem out of the ordinary because right. they've been asking me about crimes since they convicted me of a crime. And that happens all over. Anybody convicted of a crime, you can expect to be questioned about a crime. And so that's grooming. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's grooming. They, they just pull you out. They pull you out and make you part of the usual suspects. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so years later, I was in prison, and, and I was talking to Jesse Lloyd and Miss Kelly Jr. And I was like, I know how my name got in the hat. I know how, you know, my name got in the hat because when I was 11, you know, I got a record, you know, playing hide-and-go-seek. I know how J- Damien's name got in the hat. Years later, his girlfriend, because of the prejudice of the trailer park, her dad was like, oh, no, you're not dating a boy out of Lakeshore Trailer Park. They've all got a record. They're all in trouble, even though that wasn't factually accurate because people had moved into the trailer park like Damien had. So he didn't have a record. However, he suffered from the prejudice of it all the same. And so because of that prejudice, his girlfriend's, father was like oh no we're not going to provide a safe environment for y'all to you know see one another i'm just going to put a ban on it and so because of that she would sneak around to see damien and damien would have to sneak around to see her and so when he got word of that he would tell the teachers at the school hey if you see them in between class and he's carrying her books get between them and split them up i don't want them being around each other and so because of that they were put and pushed into what is a hopeless situation. They're like, we, we're, they're not going to allow us to see each other, so our only recourse is to run away to be together. And so they ran away, and the police found them and locked Damien up, and that's how his name got in the hat. Oh, so I wow. said, Jesse, how did your name get in the hat? He said, years ago, when he was nine years old, he was walking home from school, and he was cutting across the soybean field between the school and his trailer park there at Highland. And as he was going across, he seen all these flags laying out in the field, just laying there. He looked around. There wasn't nobody around. He said, somebody needs to stay and guard these in case someone steals them. So he stood there for a minute, two minutes, five minutes, a few more minutes. And then he started getting worried. He's like, oh, well, I need to get home or I'm going to get in trouble. Because he's, you know, he's supposed to come straight home from school. And now he's dallied for several minutes out in this field looking over these flags, wondering how to protect them. So then he's like, well, I can pick them up and take them to my dad and he'll know what to do with them. And so when he, by the time he made that decision and started picking the flags up, a voice from the street said, hey, stop stealing those flags. Come here. Oh, my goodness. And they told him, you either sign a deal or go to kids' prison at nine years old. That That's how sad. Jesse's name got in the hat. So I had always assumed that you guys were, like, hanging together. Is that not the case, that y'all weren't, like, close not friends and buddies running around all the time? No. So y'all barely knew each other. Correct. It was the law like enforcement Like I said, I knew people. Jesse from when he tried to beat me up at oh school. Oh, my God. And I didn't really, like, want to, you know, did it come out in your defense that you guys didn't even know each other? Not really. That's um, so sad. Yeah. No one, like, we never got to testify what, how our lives were like, really. I didn't get to testify at all, and the whole time I thought I was going to get to testify. Your, your lawyer didn't put you on the stand? He didn't call me. He, he, he taught me. He, every day... I would say, when do I get to testify? And he would say, what did you hear on the stand today that would convict you of the crime? And I'd say, well, I didn't hear anything. And then he would go, and I would have to go to the jail, and that would be it. But he never really answered my question, when do I get to testify? But the only thing you had, the only prior you had, was a juvenile conviction for this silly little trespass. Well, later on, I would steal a bag of potato chips and M&Ms from Walgreens. Well, that's not and, exactly uh, violent. And that is like Maybe violent a, a to the deep M&Ms. regret of mine, but uh, it's something I did. And, but that, that's, that's my record. Gosh. 
that's just so weird. That's so unfair. That's so dishonest that it just, it hurts me to my bones. Uh, I really feel for you. And I'm so glad that even though you had 18 plus years locked up for something you didn't do, that now you're using your life in a very productive way. Yes. Tell us, tell us about what your budget is and about how people can help your organization. Uh, yeah, you can definitely uh, go online to uh, proclaimjustice.org. Um, there, there's, there's a donate page there you can click and donate um, to support us. Um, we're in the process of updating our, our entire online presence uh, and, and rewriting our bios and things so people can learn about our clients and, and their struggles better and, and, and to write them and support them. But all that right now is being created. Um, so definitely, you can when you log on to our website, you will start seeing a lot of changes here. here and tell us the name of the website again. Proclaimjustice.org. Proclaimjustice.org, and there's a way to make a contribution. Correct. And, and, and tell the listeners what that contribution goes toward. It, it goes towards everything, um, from trial transcripts to uh, you know investigation, you know, and, and towards. Um, whatever whatever that case needs you know every case is different but they still have similarities you know transcript being one uh travel expenses to go out and speak and find witnesses um uh, my private investigator uh, mr hard my co-founder he's always out in the field uh, talking to people and, and, and turning over every stone in the case you know so we take the transcripts we figure out who was involved and then we go ask those and they may lead to people who's not even on the record at all. And those are people you want to find. Do you have lawyers associated with your organization that help with some of the transcripts and maybe some of the legal documents? We, we involve lawyers usually at the last minute due to billable hours. Their, their time is usually the most expensive when it comes no, to No, I'm talking hours. about lawyers that are willing to donate their time. There's got to be some lawyers out there willing to donate their time who have a brain and, and have some time to spend. Uh, we, we have a... Lawyer that works with us on several of our cases out of Arkansas, uh, Patrick Binka. Okay. Um, he was one of Damien's uh, uh, post-conviction attorneys. Good. And so he, he worked on our case with Tim Howard. He, he did the trial for him. And now Tim's free from death row. He was just wow. at the event the other night. Uh-huh. And, and, and living life now and, and working hard and, and, and enjoying himself. But, yeah, it costs a lot of money. It's a lot of work. Um we, we spend our money frugally. Frugally. Nobody there is getting rich. Nobody's getting Nobody's rich. Nobody's on a big salary. I, I have two jobs, and my second job I, I use to pay for you know my life and, and, and contribute to my first job. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I pull a lot of long hours. Um, I'm lucky that my second job is in the office right next to or next door to Proclaim Justice, so it doesn't cost me a lot of time going between offices and between jobs. But I, I work hard, and so does Mr. Harden, and so does our uh, other investigators and, and everything. And everybody works at cost at a minimum amount possible, but working long hours, you know, doing the good work because we believe in it. Um, you know, John told me when I got out, he said, Jason, uh, uh, seeing you guys free is the best thing that ever happened to me next to getting married and seeing my son born. I want to continue doing that for more innocent people. And I said, John, I promised the guys inside I wouldn't forget them. I promised Antonio when I worked the law library, I'm going to find a way to get you free. And if this is the way to do it, let's do this. And so we formed Proclaim Justice to keep that promise. Now, was Antonio the one involved and in, accused of the drive-by? Correct. And there's evidence of actual in innocence in his case, yes, correct? There Tell is. us about that. He was accused of a drive-by in West Memphis, Arkansas, that he, it is factually impossible for him to have committed. He was actually serving jail time in the jail for driving with one headlight, like the old Wildflower song, you know, mm -hmm. one headlight. And, and, and he had some marijuana in the ashtray, uh, you know, part of a marijuana joint. And so he would check himself in on Friday afternoon, stay the weekend in jail, and check out on Sunday. 
And jail records show that he was in jail at the time of this we drive-by, have, but they convicted him anyway. We have jail records that show that. We have the commitment papers from the judge sentencing him to the jail time. The the arrest report, we've got it all. And he's still sitting in jail. Still sitting in prison, serving life without parole as a slave in Arkansas. We've also got uh, sworn affidavits from the actual murderers, from two of three of the actual shooters. But because of the way the system is set up, they don't care about actual innocence. They don't care about actual innocence. What's so sad is during his original trial, none of the evidence was pursued or put in front of the jury to, you know, to find him innocent. You know, the defense was the state has to prove that the defendant is guilty, right, beyond a reasonable doubt. And so that was the strategy mm -hmm. that the public defender chose. Yeah. That's if you can trust the jury to hold the prosecutor to the burden of proof. Right. That's if you can trust a jury to follow the United States Constitution. Correct. Innocent until proven guilty. Proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Not, right. hey, I think he might have done it. One of the best experiences I ever had was once down in Austin. I got called for jury duty. Oh, wow. Both sides, and it was a criminal case. Both sides thought the other side would strike me. The defense thought that the uh, prosecution would strike me because I've been a criminal defendant. The prosecution okay, the thought the defense would strike me because I've been a prosecutor. I've been the elected DA. I ended up on that jury, man. Oh, wow. And not only Never was I make the, assumptions, right? I know. And I got elected foreman of that jury. And I decided for that I was just going to sit there and watch the process for a while before I started trying to direct it as foreman. And one lady raised her hand and says, well, I think we should vote guilty because I kind of think he sort of might have done it. Mm -hmm. And those words just rang in my head. I sort of think he might have kind of done it. And so I started talking with her about that sentence she had just given us and how let, let's read what the charge says about beyond a reasonable doubt and about who's got the burden of proof. And let's look at the word sort of think he kind of might have. That's some thin ice to put people's <laughs> liberties on, right? No kidding. So within about an hour, we all walked out with a not guilty verdict because everybody kind of thought he sort of might have kind of done it, but nobody really believed he did. Right, you know, and oh, it was yeah. such a weak case, and the defense lawyer and the defendant stayed around to talk with the jury afterwards, and we got to find out some things we didn't know, you know, that they weren't allowed to tell us during the trial, because so many of our trials are just legal fictions. Oh yeah, because they've got these rules about what you can say and what you can't say, and even though it's absolutely true, but you're not allowed to say it. Right. You know, and the defense lawyer has one hand tied behind his back during some of it. Oh, yes. Yet the prosecution has no hands tied. No. And the playing field is slanted in their favor. Oh, yes. And the judge just about always is going to rule with the prosecution because he's an elected official, too. Correct. Yeah. And they say, well, you know, if there's really something here, you can appeal it. Now, what kind of justice is that? Find somebody guilty? put them in jail and hope they might be able to do the right thing on appeal when you could have done the right thing sitting on that bench? No. No. I'm telling them all the time, grow some. Grow a pair, man. And, Whether you're male or female, grow a pair. Do what's right. And, and usually, you know, what, 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 what's imbalancing in that, in that equation is the state has unlimited resources to mm -hmm. investigative materials, to experts and things like that, whereas this defense, the defender of the people, does not and usually the uh and well in my case in particular the judge will rule against you mm -hmm. and on getting any help um will rule against your experts even being an expert mm -hmm. in, in their field of expertise after you've already used the money to pay them and then they won't give you any more money to get another expert after they've disqualified your expert the whole reason we allowed the hbo documentary people into the trials because they promised money for the experts is to fund experts to do testing and investigate and things like that to find the truth because 
judge wasn't giving us any money. I had no idea that the HBO documentaries would be what would actually save us. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking immediately what my attorneys are talking about. We need money for experts to investigate, you know. And so that was the whole premise behind that, the whole purpose behind allowing HBO there. I'm so glad that we did, even though we never did get money for the experts. We never did get that. However, what we did get was the trials recorded in their entirety and then played back for the world to see and to call foul. And, and That's know. good, but you should have got the money for the experts, too. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Hollywood, man. Well, one, right. of the, one of the issues, too, right, with that case is that the medical examiner in Arkansas is, is part of the prosecution, right? Uh, yes. Uh, Frank Peretti, uh, Kermit yes. Channel. Yes. Um, Frank Peretti, he's not even accredited. Uh, he's not even board certified. Or board certified. Yeah. Um, and he made a lot of mistakes in his assessment, you know, uh, of, you know, the cause of death and, and what he was looking at as wounds on the, on the children's bodies and what he was attributing as the mechanism for those wounds. Yeah, a serrated knife. Yeah, right. And it wasn't. It was a no. turtle mouth. Yeah. yeah. And so what they had, they had Jesse look at these photos of these poor kids and, and, and all these wounds on them and he just made up a story for whatever he was seeing a believable story because that's all what 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 they say we have a believable story and that's enough right. for you to lose your life and liberty yeah. in this they're reading tea leaves is what they're doing yeah. it's got no basis in science they're reading tea leaves but they knew he didn't know anything about the crime he the crime happened on may the 5th on a wednesday on may the 10th he went into the uh, police department trying to get the reward money because there was already reward money out there for anybody who had any knowledge of the crime or knew anything about it. Good he Lord. went in because he saw a suspicious character on the side of the road asking people to go drink wine in the woods, right? Him and his friend from his trailer park out at Highland, because that's where he lived and where he grew up and where his friends were, were walking down the street and this guy came out and was like, hey, let's go into the woods and drink some wine. He's like, well, that's suspicious. I'm going to report it to the police. Now, this is not the actions of a kid who has committed a murder and is trying to hide it. This is a kid who's trying to help the police solve a murder and report anything suspicious he comes across. And that's what he did. So they knew. They knew he didn't know anything about the crime. They knew when they had him making up all these different stories while looking at the photos. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, in, in, in the confession just, tapes. Yeah, know? it reminds me just like Lucas. Yeah. How they just guide him in and, no, that's not right, Jesse or Henry. No, that's not right. No, think maybe, again. maybe it's this. Maybe it's this. Oh, pisses think me again. off. Yeah. yeah. And when I was arrested, my mom, like, I got arrested on my last day of school. So the school is out for the summer. That It's Thursday, and when I get arrested, Friday, I'm getting arraigned. They tell my mom, because they arrest me based on this false confession of Jesse's, you know, that says we skip school and all that. And they tell my mom, my mom's like, well, I know Jason didn't skip school. I know he was at school, you know. And they're like, well, if you can go get his school records that proves he was at school, we'll let him go to you right now. And so it took a Herculean effort for my mother to go down to that school when school is closed for the summer. Even though they have a skeleton crew, she had to get them to let her in there and talk to them and convince them to give over the school records to her so she could take them to the police to prove to them that I'm telling the truth. Yeah. And what do they do with that? Instead of upholding and keeping their promise to my mother, who is an upstanding citizen of the community, they just lied to her and went back to Jesse and had him change his lies around. Right, right. So I just had him change it about you guys skipping yeah. school. Yeah, and so that, that's part of the problem. You know, there, there's got to be honor and integrity in the system for it to work. When you strip honor and integrity away, then the system's going to fail. You're going to have a system that preys on the people instead of protects the people. I agree. And it's like you guys talked about, too, the ripple effect of that to your families, to the communities. You know, a couple individuals deceiving affected so many people in this case. Oh, yes. And that ripple eventually hit Hollywood to allow those movies to be made. Peter Jackson came in and funded one of the documentaries. Yes, he did. Um, one of the things I like about the, I like a lot about the uh, film Devil's Knot that we made, it's like a prequel to the documentaries because a lot of the stuff in it 
we were able to show happened before the documentarians got there or for instance when the documentarians were forced to leave the courtroom and all the other media were forced to leave the courtroom like the judge uh, cleared the courtroom of the jurors of all the spectators of all the cameras when they had the uh, testimony from the kid who drove the uh, ice cream truck this kid drove the ice cream truck in the town when when the murders happened and after murders happened he went to California California police picked him up they interrogated him until he's like hey you know let me go or I'm just gonna give a false confession you know is that what y'all want a false confession let me go all right I committed the crime so he, he gave us this false confession a commitment to crime so they let him go out of the police station right and so Judge Burnett, he's already ruled that there's no such thing as false confessions. In Jesse's case, he said that's not a false confession. So we're like, well, is this not a false confession then? Yeah, really. And so to get that testimony, we wanted to call him forth, you know, to put that on trial for the jurors to hear. But the judge wouldn't allow the jurors to hear it, even though he did allow that testimony to get on the record. And so what was important, that was one of the things I found important to show in the film because it did not make the documentary right. because the documentarians were removed from the courtroom and so that was important of me to get in the film but there was so much more important things for like pam hicks the mother of stevie branch right she wanted people to remember her son not as he was seen in the crime scene photos but as she remembered him right singing to her you know skipping going away going to school together and so to work with her and see her work with the little boy who played her son. Right. And, and to see all the love that everybody on set gave to her, what well, was so healing, you know, because the community turned on her because they didn't like the way she grieved. Really? They didn't like the fact that she questioned the verdict. Oh, my God. Oh, yes. And so we, we, we surrounded her and gave her love and, and let her know that she is okay and that we support her and, and, and in return she adopted me as her son nice you know and, well, and, 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 and mr byers came around too for he you guys he did he did you know and, and and all the grief that you know the families feel you know I, that's understanding i get that i understand that you know and, and and so it was always been my prayer that you know they would all receive healing and and, and be able to get the strength to look at the case and, and, and like, hey, we really need to find who did this. And so that took tremendous strength and, and, and of character on, on Pam and on Mark for them to face that. And, and, and I have nothing but respect for them and admiration because of that. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know about that. Yeah. With your organization, is it just the one fundraiser a year in the website, or are there other things you do to raise money for the organization? Correct. Right now, it's just the one fundraiser a year in the website. Um, when will that? And, and even there? that takes a lot of our bandwidth. We'd rather be working on cases, and um, yeah. hopefully, um, we we did a really good job at this fundraiser. We're hoping that we'll be able to uh, bifurcate like our our work and have like people that work specifically on fundraising. So. John and, and I and then the rest of our crew can specifically work on casework. Cases, yeah. Right, that way we don't have to, like, juggle the two, you know. When When is the fundraiser next year? It's, uh, every, it's, our, our goal is to have it every November here every in Austin. Every November, yeah. okay. Even though this one was in February due to scheduling, you know, scheduling issues, it's our first one, but we're going to try to make sure to have it every November. As soon as you get the date, I want that on my calendar for sure. Me and Jonathan both. Yeah, because that was a lot of fun. It awesome, really was. awesome. I will definitely let you guys know, and I, I appreciate y'all being there. Oh, we supporting. loved it. We I, just loved I, I was it. honored to have y'all next to me at my table. I was honored to be with you. Hi, I'm Vic Fazell. During these trying times, you might want to just stay home. And at the law offices of Vic Fazell, we understand. That's why we're set up to handle your personal injury claim without you even having to come in. Just give us a call and we'll take it from there. We can send any paperwork straight to your smartphone or computer. Don't delay, because if we don't put money in your pocket, you don't owe us anything. I'm Vic Fazell.